safe from them. For if they wished for a thing, they summoned it from the other side of the world. And always, as they labored and rested, as they feasted and made love, there was a drum in their ears, the pulse of the giant city, beating and beating like a man's heart. Were they happy? Interesting question. What is happiness to the gods? They were great. They were mighty. They were wonderful and terrible. As I looked upon them and their magic, I felt like a child. But a little more, it seemed to me, and they would pull down the moon from the sky. I saw them with wisdom beyond wisdom and knowledge beyond knowledge. And yet, not all they did was well done. Even I could see that. And yet their wisdom could not but grow until all was peace. 325. Then I saw their fate come upon them, and that was terrible past speech. It came upon them as they walked the streets of their city. I have been in the fights with the forest people. I have seen men die. But this was not like that. When gods war with gods, they use weapons we do not know. It was fire falling out of the sky, and a mist that poisoned. It was the time of the great burning and the destruction. They ran about like ants in the streets of their city. Poor gods, poor gods. Then the towers began to fall. A few escaped, yes, a few. The legends tell it. But even after the city had become a dead place, for many years the poison was still in the ground. I saw it happen. I saw the last of them die. It was darkness over the broken city. And I wept. Now this is often referred to as the vision quest. The vision finally comes. And what is it that the young boy sees? Three things. One, he sees the dynamic technological advances that are a part of the city. Two, he sees the unbelievable population. All of these people living together. It was amazing. Even in the night it was like daytime because of the light. And the dynamism, the noise that was affiliated when you put all of these people in the city together. Three, most horrifyingly, it, he realizes what happened. I'm with you now on page 325. Notice he says it. Their fate came upon them. And that was terrible past speech. When gods war with gods, they use weapons we do not know. What an amazing line. Look at it again. When gods war with gods, they use weapons that we do not know. Of course, the irony and the beauty of this, of this text, the gods in this story are just humans of, a, of an earlier time. In other words, any time humans use weapons they do not know, they do not know what it is that they're doing with these weapons. Go back to page 324, last two lines. I saw them with wisdom beyond wisdom and knowledge beyond knowledge, and yet all was not well done. They ran like ants. This is an interesting word picture. If you've ever destroyed an anthill, that's the picture of what happens with the devastation. And then it comes the line, poor gods, poor gods. Oh, pay attention to this. In this moment, you have a child who is feeling sorry for the ones who lived before. And now all of a sudden, they're poor gods. What a tragedy, he says. Finally, the towers fell. All kinds of symbolism going on here, right? The towers fell. You couldn't go into the city because of the poison that was still in the ground. Now, mustard gas was used in the First World War. But it's going to be Benet, who's already prophetic, in suggesting that long after the dropping of those weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there was stuff in the ground, stuff in the air. That radioactive stuff remains long after the fact. And humans, of course, can't go back to these places for long periods of time. In other words, Benet has given us an, an, an imagination in 1937 of what it's like when humans fight humans with technologies they do not understand but they somehow have created these technologies, the great burning, and the final culmination at level one, when the young man finally realizes what the city of the gods actually is and who the gods were, and that only a few of them escaped, and he must be one of those 
who many years ago some ancestor of his escaped, all he can do is weep. I wept. All this I saw. Notice he says it again. I saw. Let's finish the story now, of course. That is to say, as the young man begins to see Revelation, Epiphany, so do you as a reader. And the story should reach out and begin to kind of grab you a little bit, right? All this I saw. I saw it as I have told it, though not in the body. When I woke in the morning, I was hungry, but I did not think first of my hunger, for my heart was perplexed and confused. I knew the reason for the dead places, but I did not see why it had happened. Right? It seemed to me it should not have happened, with all the magic they had. I went through the house, looking for an answer. There was so much in the house I could not understand, and yet I am a priest and the son of a priest. It was like being on one side of the great river at night with no light to show the way. Then I saw the dead God. He was sitting in his chair by the window in a room I had not entered before, and for the first moment I thought that he was alive. Then I saw the skin on the back of his hand. It was like dry leather. The room was shut, hot and dry. No doubt that had kept him as he was. At first, I was afraid to approach him. Then, the fear left me. He was sitting, looking out over the city. He was dressed in the clothes of the gods. His age was neither young nor old. I could not tell his age. But there was wisdom in his face and great sadness. You could see that he would not have run away. He had sat at his window, watching his city die than he himself had died. But it is better to lose one's life than one's spirit, and you could see from the face that his spirit had not been lost. I knew that if I touched him, he would fall into dust, and yet there was something unconquered in the face. That is all of my story, for then I knew he was a man. I knew then that they had been men, neither gods nor demons. It is a great knowledge, hard to tell and believe. They were men. They went a dark road, but they were men. I had no fear after that. I had no fear going home, though twice I fought off the dogs, and once I was hunted for two days by the forest people. When I saw my father again, I prayed and was purified. He touched my lips and my breast. He said, 326. You, away a boy. you come back a man and a priest. I said, Father, they were men. I have been in the place of the gods and seen it. Now slay me if it is the law, but still I know they were men. He looked at me out of both eyes. He said, The law is not always the same shape. You have done what you have done. I could not have done it in my time, but you come after me. Tell. I told, and he listened. After that, I wished to tell all the people, but he showed me otherwise. He said, Truth is a hard deer to hunt. If you eat too much truth at once, you may die of the truth. It was not idly that our fathers forbade the dead places. He was right. It is better the truth should come little by little. I have learned that, being a priest. Perhaps in the old days, they ate knowledge too fast. Nevertheless, we make a beginning. It is not for the metal alone we go to the dead places now. There are the books and the writings. They are hard to learn. And the magic tools are broken, but we can look at them and wonder. At least we make a beginning. And when I am chief priest, we shall go beyond the great river. We shall go to the place of the gods, the place New York, not one man, but a company. We shall look for the images of the gods and find the god Ashing and the others, 
the gods Lincoln and Biltmore and Moses. But they were men who built the city, not gods or demons. They were men. I remember the dead man's face. They were men who were here before us. We must build again. Now the story will culminate with his recognition. Let's put this word in our notes. Epiphany. When you come to a recognition, you learn something you didn't know before. Many of my sophomores say, this story has a strange haunting effect. Because as you begin to read the story, you kind of find yourself going, do you think any of this is actually possible in our future? I mean, I know I play video games where it kind of imagines that there's no real world left anymore because everything gets blown up. This story slowly unfolds. In 1937, when this story is published, guys, it is a mind screw that you're looking ahead into the future imagining the end of it all. That is to say, the end of humankind because of, well, let's finish. He returns to his father and he says, here's what I learned. They weren't gods. They weren't demons. They were men just like us. Notice he says to his dad, the law says I have to die, I have to die. The father is like, look, two things. The law is, you know, the law, but no, we're not going to kill you for that. Secondly, did you see what the father said to him? The father said to him, he looked at me both eyes, he said, the law is not always the same shape. You have done what you have done. I could not have done it in my time, but you come after me. In other words, it's been long enough that the radioactivity, the bad stuff in the air is now gone so that you can do it. The other way to think about this is the young overcome the old. The young go beyond the old. The old generation did what they did. Today, talk to anybody that used to have music they played on a turntable with vinyl. And most people don't even know how. I don't know if you caught this, but just recently there was some video about young people trying to figure out how to dial on a phone. That's the old-fashioned one where you turn. And they could not figure it out. It made no sense to them at all. They'd speak into it, their number. They could not understand the very older technologies, which, again, is just proof how it's, it's happening. But I want to go to the story that he tells and then the end. Look with me on page 326. After that, I wish to tell all the people, but my father said, no, 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 we can't tell everybody he says it this way, the key line of this story. We've read all this story to get to this line, so let's pay attention to it. Truth, quote, Truth is a hard deer to hunt. If you eat too much truth at once, you may die of the truth. It was not idly that our fathers forbid the dead places. In other words, you got to you got to be careful the way you go after the truth, after knowledge. Keep reading. He says it this way. My father was right. It's better the truth should come little by little. I have learned that being a priest. Perhaps in the old days, they ate knowledge too fast. Now, of course, this eating of knowledge, that word picture of eating takes us back to the famous story, of course, the Garden of Eden story, where the forbidden fruit is eaten. That idea that knowledge is like eating, of course, is made most powerfully, and your senior year will study it at 3A, you can write it down, with Milton's famous Paradise Lost, the retelling of that story of the eating of the fruit in the forbidden, uh, in the, in the forbidden fruit in the garden and all of that, right? Okay. In other words, what is it that Binet is saying about scientific advancement? We can go really fast in our development of science. We think of today like things like cloning and other kinds of things, right? We can go really, really fast, but is that necessarily going to be good for us? Nevertheless, we make a beginning, he says. We need the books. We need the writings. We need to return to this place, New York, and then finally, I remember the dead man's face. That is to say, that man that he stumbles onto. They were men who were before us. And then the final line of the story, we must build again. Now this is an interesting idea because it takes us full circle. In other words, 
This young man is saying, we've got to now get ready for a future, but the obvious question is, how do we not just repeat all of the mistakes of the past and then play the game again? All right, that's level one. Let's jump to level 2A quickly. Themes, messages. Here we go. What is for you the major theme of this story? What is for you the major message of this story? Many have said that it is, of course, a cautionary tale. Be careful. Technologies can create all kinds of challenges, issues for us. That is to say, we can build the computer, but what happens when the computer or the technology can control us? That is to say... Do you control the technology or does the, or does the technology control you? To what degree are we actually as free given all of our technological advances? Right? Now, another major message here. The young have to go where the old often will say, that's too dangerous. That's a place we're not supposed to go. It is the young who will, of course, in the end, destroy the old. Think about that notion of going beyond as a kind of destruction. Put this at 3A really quickly. When we study in our junior year, the great American poet Walt Whitman leaves a grass song of myself. We'll get to passage 46, 47, write that down. He most honors me who learns under it to destroy the teacher. The idea is that for Whitman, what every teacher is supposed to do is to help make the student go beyond the teacher be better than the teacher, more knowledgeable than the teacher, and in the process destroy the teacher. We're having, uh, obviously, that message here as well. Uh, of course, at uh, 2B, we've already mentioned a number of things here. The, the point of view of first person, the power of the first person narrative. Of course, as well, the symbolism. What is for you the key symbol? Some have said it's that old dead man sitting in that bedroom looking out the window over the city of New York with a face of wisdom and tragic sorrow. In other words, this was clearly a very educated man who lived in this apartment and yet tragically watched the city he loved destroy itself or be destroyed with these technologies. And that saddens him. Of course, that symbol is the reason why the young man, the young priest, is going to return to the city of New York to learn more in the future. At 3A, well, we've mentioned so many titles, but write it down. What is for you the text of all texts that is this, plays this post-apocalyptic game? What's your favorite movie that shows what happens after the world is destroyed? What's your favorite video game that shows that? What's your favorite music video or track of music that plays the same game? That's in all of these texts somewhat cautionary to say, yes, the human mind can split the atom. Yes, the human mind can, t can make an atomic weapon. Yes, the human mind can make an, a, 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 a weapon that's dropped in the war. But is it the best thing to do? And is there a difference between knowledge and wisdom? You can know stuff, but how is that the same thing as wisdom? Hmm. Finally, number 3B. Let's go there now. What about conflict resolution? Do you have any fears that, in fact, the human species might someday find a way to destroy itself through these technologies? Or are you convinced that your generation will find a way to gain the wisdom so that we can resolve conflict without killing each other? By the way, just up to 3A one more time. When you are a senior, you will study with me Golding's classic novel, Lord of Flies, which is a companion read to By the Rivers of Babylon, a story about a group of boys who end up on an island and they have to survive and one of those boys decides the best way to resolve conflict is by dropping rocks on the other boys' heads. His name, Jack. We'll talk about that one in our senior year. If you're interested, you can find that lecture, by the way, in the senior B folder at learnstrong.net if you'd like to take a look at it before you finally arrive in 303 as a senior. The challenge of this text. Now, finally, and I, I predicted we would end with this question is what's up with the title? By the waters of Babylon? By the waters of Babylon? By the way, just flip back several pages in your text to page 321, and there you'll have some information about the Babylonian captivity, right? 
The title of the story by the waters of Babylon is an allusion, a reference to Psalm 137 in the Bible. We've read that already. In 586, as we mentioned, King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and exiled the Israelites to Babylon. The Babylonian captivity, as this period is known, ended in 538 when King Cyrus of Persia formally freed the Israelites. In Psalm 137, the captive Israelites weep over their lost homeland, Zion, in lines such as this one. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Question, in what sense are John and his tribe in exile from the home where their ancestors lived? And of course, that notion of returning is there in the final line. We must build again. But build what? Final 3B question, what will you build in the future that you think will be a better world? Will you build a better world than the world of the past? And what role will you play in the building of that world? Whoa, there's a compelling question that I hope will challenge you. Well, there you go, Benet's classic, By the Waters of Babylon. I hope you've been challenged. Thank you.